where are the men? Because these days, it seems like we're not around. I mean, we're around, we're just not around. Because most men choose to be more like the abominable snowman, footprints everywhere but nowhere to be found. We live in a generation of boys that are being raised to be men, just like their mothers because 70% of them in the African-American community and 40% in rising in the Anglo community don't even have fathers. So I'm just saying, we're around, we're just not around. Spending all of our time right in the middle of a decaying culture that we ourselves are bound. Women, they're forced to be mothers, fathers, leaders, protectors, nurturers, providers. They're pretty much doing it all, in some sense, operating all outside of their created being. And then you and I, we want to take them to the counselor and tell the counselor that she won't submit. Submit? Submit to what? Submit to a man who himself will not submit? Well, that will automatically create friction. And besides, it's an inherent contradiction. Jesus' whole life was about submitting to the will of his Father. So if we're supposed to be men who are following Christ, we ought to submit as he did so that our kids can watch us submit to the Father. So the problems you feel you may have with your wife, the next man won't experience with your daughter. Girls, some, have a twisted view of love these days. I've literally seen some date the devil just to experience a man. While boys think their manhood is wrapped in the how many women they can sleep with just like their Rolling Stone daddies and handling their problems with a gun in their hand, and it's all because of the absence of a man, Oh, we're around. I'm just saying we're not around. Look around. Our culture is suffering because of the man's unwillingness to suffer. But when I look at Christ, I see that he suffered, especially when he hung on the cross. So it seems to me that suffering is the job description given to man from the boss. Suffer. Yeah, that requires that you and I be a little bit tougher. And I'm not talking about just staying at work later and chasing harder after shiny things and dreams. You know how men do even though I do realize that we all have to provide, I'm talking about suffering and Christ sufferings because that's the only thing that'll keep your legacy in mind. Like when my granddad died and he was there laying on his death cot, his kids and his kids' kids weren't standing around talking about the things that he bought. I think not. It was more like when my sister Crystal went over to him and said, Grandpa, Grandpa, your great grandkids are running around going crazy as if this is a day to celebrate. Do you want me to quiet the boys? Grandpa said, no, no, Crystal, you don't understand. This is a day to celebrate because I wanted to die to this noise. And then it happened. He fell asleep right there in the middle of his own den. But I can still see the pride in his eyes because he was surrounded by all his kingdom men that came from him. Yet we prayed with him and we also thanked him for not letting anything in his life be a deterrent because now that allows his legacy one day to hear what he heard that day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But I got another granddad. We call him Two Daddy. He's in Baltimore. He still lives. And some of you may know a little bit about his story because that's how my dad, Tony Evans, is who he is. First generation Christian. Don't think the Evans family was always saved. You'd be amazed. From high school dropouts and drugs and poverty, that was our legacy back in the days. But Two Daddy found that word. He ran into Christ and then he got saved. And he held that thing tight and never fumbled it, even though his wife took him through an emotional maze. And if she was still here, she'd tell you, it lasted about 365 days. He suffered a lot as well. But around about day 367, she came downstairs with tears in her eyes because the spirit put her under a spell. And I'm not talking abracadabra. This was a courageous investment of my two daddy's time. And now that one year of suffering has become a 50 year harvest that I can call mine and my wife, and my daughter, and my son, and my son, and my child to come. And it's our job to hold that legacy tight until Jesus comes and says that it's done. But enough about me, what about you? What does your legacy become? And if your legacy hasn't started yet, I dare you to be the first one. That's enough. I've come and I've said what I need to say. Besides, my prayer is simple, that the men watching this right now will become kingdom men if not already and start building your legacies today because that will be your greatness. I just want to say that I am proud of all of you. I'm proud of each and every one of you. For the game that you played tonight, 
and the man that you have become this season. Hey, this is Jonathan Evans, the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm excited to be here with John Irwin and the whole Woodlawn team. We're just really excited about the movie. Everybody's got to go see it because it's promoting unity, and that's what we need. Our culture, our country, um, and even our churches, we need this, and it's a movie that's very exciting, and it's very fun for the whole family. We've had such a good time, me and my dad, Tony Evans. We've even created a discipleship book called The Playbook so that young people, uh, athletes, those who love sports can use this movie as a catalyst to be better people in the game of life as they move forward to the purpose that God has called them to.